Hi everyone, Ross Satchel from Microchip back again. Welcome to episode 6 in our Tiny2 Bare Metal series. In the previous video, episode 5, we toggled the onboard LED using only hardware peripherals. That is, we used Timer Counter A, TCA, and its associated overflow interrupt service routine, ISR, to toggle the LED, and then we put the CPU to sleep in between toggles. We also used Configuration Change Protection, CCP, registers to set up the system clock and to also output the clock, which is a useful sanity check when setting up a new project to be sure the clock is what you expect it to be before setting up peripherals and writing your application code. In this episode, we will modify our Tiny2 Curiosity Nano board so that we can carry out low power measurements. Don't worry, it's a really simple mod. We will also cover how to connect your power supply and meter to measure current consumption. To find out how to modify our Curiosity Nano to do that, let's open the hardware user guide. We can access it from MPLabX in the kit window under external links. In the hardware user guide, section 3 is Curiosity Nano, then under that in section 4 is low power measurement. So let's open that. It shows us that we need to cut the target power strap on the top side of the Curiosity Nano, which on the Tiny2 is right above the microchip logo and is clearly labelled power. I just used the knife on my multi-tool and then checked with a continuity tester that I'd fully cut through the strap. Here's a picture of my Curiosity Nano after I cut the strap. Once that's done, just solder in on the top side a 2-pin header with spacing 2.54mm or 0.1 inches. Here's a picture of my Curiosity Nano after I soldered in the header. Then when you want to power the Tiny2 from the USB micro connector, just place a jumper across the pin header we just soldered in, and when you want to do low power measurements, simply remove the jumper and use an external power supply. Keep in mind that if you want to use the onboard programmer debugger, you will need to have the jumper in place and power from USB. Now that's done, let's go over the circuit diagram of connecting the power supply and the meter to measure the current. The bench meter is set up to measure current and is connected in what's known as a high side configuration. That is, if you think of the power flowing from the highest point to the lowest point, then the bench meter is before or higher than the device under power, which in this case is our Curiosity Nano. So the power supply positive output connects to the positive input of the bench meter. The negative input of the bench meter then connects to the header you just soldered in place. Make sure you connect it to the pin that's closest to the onboard button switch as shown in the diagram. Then the Curiosity Nano ground connects to the power supply ground to complete the circuit. Now you're ready to start taking low power measurements, which is something commonly required for battery powered and other low power applications. So now we will measure the current consumption of each Blinky project that we've done so far. But before we start measuring the current consumption, to level the playing field as much as possible for each project, we should disable all unused I.O. pins. Also, for the project that had the peripheral clock as an output that we measured as a sanity check, which was in episode 5, we should turn that off since not all projects use that. So we had two projects using active mode, and those were our first two projects, episode 3, Blink with Software Delay Function, and episode 4, Blink by Polling TCA Interrupt Status Flag. Then we had one project using sleep modes, which was episode 5, Blink using only TCA interrupts with both idle and standby sleep modes. Then in our next video, we will create a Blinky project using the lowest current consumption possible. So to turn off all the unused I.O. pins, we're going to use the data sheet as well as an app note, AN2515, AVR Low Power Techniques, link in the description below. Let's start with the app note, AN2515. I'm going to jump to section 1, Relevant Devices, which shows us that this app note covers the Tiny0, Tiny1, 
and Mega AVR0 families. Now while our Tiny2 is not in the covered devices, much of the content will still be very useful. I recommend you take the time to read this whole app note, but due to time constraints, I will jump to the most relevant section for this video, which is section 9, unused pins. It explains that all digital pins are left floating by default to prevent hardware conflicts. However, this is prone to leakage, and while small, this leakage will certainly affect our low power measurements, especially in sleep modes. It explains that enabling the internal pull-up will minimize this leakage. It goes on to say that we can also disable the digital input buffer to further lower the power consumption, and that both disabling the digital input buffer and enabling the internal pull-up can be done in the pin control N registers for the individual pins. Let's quickly jump to the data sheet to see exactly how to do both of these. Open section 17, port, IO pin configuration. Now let's jump to the functional description. It tells us that after a reset, all outputs are tri-stated and digital input buffers are enabled regardless of the clock setup. Then under pin configuration, which is mostly about the pin control registers, near the end, there's a small section on pull-ups that tells us we can enable the internal pull-up in the pin control register. Then right at the end of pin configuration, it tells us the digital input buffer for a pin can be disabled by writing the input disable setting to ISC which is the input sense configuration. This can reduce power consumption, which is exactly what we want. We also saw this in the app note earlier. So then jumping to the port register summary, we can click on one of the pin control registers and the three least significant bits are ISC or input sense configuration. And we can see one of the options is input disable. Then bit number three is the pull-up enable, and we just have to write a one to that register bit. Jumping back to MPLAB X, so I will reopen the code from episode three. Let's also include and open the header file. It's avr forward slash iotn 1627.h. Then control click to follow it. Now control F to search. And we can just type in the register field setting, which was input underscore disable. There's only one match for that. And as usual, the group configuration macro starts with the module, then the relevant register bit names, then the setting itself. So it's port underscore isc underscore input disable underscore gc for group configuration. So I will just copy that. While we're in the header file, let's also search for the pull-up enabled bitmask macro. Since in the data sheet, the bit name is pull-up en, let's just search for that. The first result is port underscore pull-up en underscore bm, or bitmask, which is the one we want. Again, notice it has the module name port, then the setting, since it's a single bit as opposed to a group configuration which was the input disable that we just did previously. Back in the main.c file, I will create a function called init ports, which takes no parameters and has a void return. Then I will first move the LED pin PB7 direction register code into my new function. And then I will disable all unused port pins and enable the pull-ups. We have to do individual writes to each pin's pin control register. But how do we know how many pins each port has? Let's jump back to the data sheet to find out. Section 3, IO multiplexing and considerations. We can see the fifth column in the table has the pin names. So port A has pins 0 to 7. Port B has pins 0 to 7. Then port C has pins 0 to 5. Back in MPLAB X again, and we can now disable all unused pins. I will start with port A pin 0. So it's port A dot pin 0 control equals, then paste the macro we copied from the header file for the input sense configuration. 
Then we OR that with the pull up enabled bitmask macro. Now do that for all pins except for PB7, which is our LED. For the other projects, we will just copy and paste these register rights. I will assume that you can do that on your own. So now that's done, I will go through our previous projects in order to compare the current consumption. Let's start with the project from episode 3, Blink with Delay. I have screen captures of my bench meter here. Now for each of the projects, there will be two current levels, one when the LED is on and the other when the LED is off. So for the first in active mode, blink with delay, we have about 1.9 milliamps when the LED is on and about 0.88 milliamps when the LED is off. Now for the second project in active mode, blink by polling, which was in episode 4, we have about 2 milliamps when the LED is on and about 0.99 milliamps when the LED is off. Now for the TCA sleep modes, which were both in episode 5. In idle sleep mode, we're using about 1.55 milliamps when the LED is on and about 0.5 milliamps when the LED is off. Then in standby sleep mode, we have about 1.55 milliamps when the LED is on and about 0.5 milliamps when the LED is off. Now to compare those measurements with the specs in the datasheet, let's jump to the datasheet section 33, which is electrical characteristics. Then under that is section 33.5, power consumption. So there's active mode and the different sleep modes. Then the column labeled condition has the oscillator set up. We have been using the 20 MHz oscillator and a prescaler of 6, giving us 3.333333 MHz, which is not on this list, but we can reasonably estimate that our current consumption would be less than what is used at 5 MHz. So at 5 MHz, the datasheet shows 1.6 milliamps, and at 3.333333 MHz, we measured 0.9 milliamps. So that makes sense. Then in idle sleep mode at 3 volts and 5 MHz, the datasheet shows 0.6 milliamps. We measured 0.5 milliamps. So that also makes sense. Notice in the datasheet that standby mode only shows the RTC, or real-time counter. Why is that? Let's jump to section 12, sleep controller, to find out. In the functional description, you may recall from last episode that there's a table showing the peripherals and whether they were active in standby sleep mode. Many peripherals are not, but for those that were available, the user had to set the run standby bit for the peripheral in question. Notice that the RTC is available in standby sleep mode. Then the periodic interval timer, or PIT, is the only thing available in power down mode, which is the deepest sleep mode available on the Tiny 2. So in our next video, we will set up each of the RTC and PIT, and put them in each of the sleep modes that they can use, and then measure the current consumption. Then we will compare the measurements from all of our projects so far. See you in the next video.